What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. So this time I'm going to be showing you how to use cross-site scripting to steal session cookies, which is something that's been done quite a bit before, but I like to show my methodology of how I approach it and maybe you'll learn something from it. So cross-site scripting is a vulnerability category that you've probably heard of if you've ever studied anything about web application vulnerabilities. Uh, it's really common to see and it's one of the easier ones to kind of get, get like a grasp on. Um, but a lot of people still, you know, when they first start, they're not sure exactly, well, what is it that we can do? And in this demonstration, we're gonna steal a session cookie. So I wanted to show kind of my methodology when I'm approaching a web application to even first find where cross-site scripting may exist. And I'm gonna use this Port Swigger Academy application as kind of like my example, like that's gonna be where I showcase everything, but this doesn't intend to serve as like um, a solution guide to this lab or anything like that. But in this case, we've got a web application that allows for people to make comments on a blog post. So if we scroll down into the comments section, this right here is an awesome place where I'm gonna be looking to inject JavaScript. And that's because I've got the ability to type whatever it is that I want, and whatever I type gets displayed back onto the page. So one of the things I wanna do when I'm looking for cross-site scripting is I'm gonna start with a text that's easy for me to find later. So I might do like one, two, three. And then there's a few characters that I wanna see if are allowed. And if they are allowed, do they get encoded? And I'll show you what I mean. So the characters that I like to do are angle brackets, single quote, and then double quote. Um, because these four characters are pretty much the special characters that you're gonna need in order to break out of the HTML and start your own script tag in order to execute JavaScript as part of the exploitation process. So I'm gonna just see, hey, can I actually leave a comment here with those special characters? For name, I'm just gonna say anything. And email is gonna be email. Website will say that. Cool. So we'll post our comment. It looks like it's been submitted. That's awesome. We'll go back to the blog. And if we scroll down, we see our comment is displayed right there back to us. Um, what I like to do at this point is actually go in to view the page source. And this is why I like to do that one, two, three ahead of time, because then you can just control F and then you could search for one, two, three. And it will take you straight into the page where you had basically your payload inserted. And we could see right here, all those special characters that I threw into the page are reflected back and they're not encoded. So usually if, if people are implementing encoding as a part of a, a mitigation strategy against injection attacks like this, then you'll see like, I think it's uh, ampersand LT for less than and ampersand like, you know, GT for greater than and, and it'll be very clear that you're not actually getting the characters that you put. And that's a good way to mitigate against cross-site scripting. And obviously they don't have that implemented here. So that's awesome. So I'm gonna close this out and now I can get kind of malicious with this and I could do like a basic proof of concept payload, which is probably for the best. So we can come in and we can say script alert. And this is one that you've probably seen. There's all kinds of different like types to pull this off, but I'm gonna do this script alert. And what that should do is it should make a JavaScript that sends an XSS alert as soon as you load the page up. So we'll test that out. We'll just go ahead and say anything again, email, I don't know, whatever I did last time. Cool. And we'll post that comment. So now in theory, anybody who browses to this blog right here, we should get, bam, a pop-up alert, which is really cool. And this type of cross-site scripting is probably the most dangerous because it's stored cross-site scripting. A user doesn't have to click on a link that you sent to them as an attacker in order for it to pop in their browser and do whatever it is you're looking to do. All they have to do is browse to this page, right? And they could do that by their own means. And so it's a good way to, I guess, get more people even because you don't have to like send it in wait, right? Like people will just come across it on their own because they're browsing the website. So cool. We've got two different examples. We know that we've got the alerting capabilities. That's our proof of concept that we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Now we're going to try to get malicious with it and we're going to use this text right over here. Um, so I made this blog post a few months back and it just is a way for me to store, <laughs> store my payload so I can easily reference it later. Um, but basically we're going to copy all this down 
And if you have Burp Suite Pro, you could use Burp Collaborator and throw the Burp Collaborator URL right there. Um, you also don't have to use, I'm going to use this webhook.site because they give you, you know, you just copy this web address and you can throw that right here. And then you can just wait. And anytime someone browses to that URL, it'll show you here on the left pane. So if you don't want to spin up your own web server and do all that, um, then you could use something like this. But if you do, I mean, I think if you're on like an internal uh, or like a, if you're on an engagement for a client, you may want to make sure that they're cool with you using public hosted tools like this. Um, because I'm pretty sure, I mean, I have no idea, but this information, who knows, this website might store that and log in. You don't want to do anything that's going to make a client uncomfortable or put them in a vulnerable situation. So it may be best to spin up your own hosted environment, maybe in DigitalOcean or something like that, and use that URL instead to capture this. But what we're doing is we're going to inject our own script tag, and it's basically going to say, okay, our image source, it's going to go out to try to pull down this image to display on the page, and it's going to be at this web address. And this web address is our malicious web server. And then it's going to create, or at least add in this C parameter, and then it's telling it to do cookie or document.cookie. So that's going to tell your browser, okay, find any of the cookies that are in my browser at the moment, throw it into this part of the command, and then send this out and try to pull down an image at that location of this remote web server. So if we're monitoring the logs for this remote web server, we should see a C equals, a, a git request for the C equals and then whatever that user's document cookie is and that's their session cookie. So it'll make sense here as soon as I show it. So I'm gonna copy this out. We'll throw that in and this time we'll do all this again. Whoops, going too fast. Okay, so we're gonna post this and we're gonna head back. We, we can see we don't have any, we're still waiting for a request, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it from my user account, the, the one that I've been interacting with. Um, but as soon as I click back to blog, if everything's working right, we should see that's, that payload pop here. And then when I scroll down in order to load this image, check that out. We just got a, a Git request here on our, on our website hook, our webhook site. And if we look at the details, we have a C, right? Because that was that question mark C. And then we get session equal to this value. That's awesome. Now we know my, because I was the one that, that did this, my session cookie is equal to that value. So I could copy this, and I'll zoom in a bit. I could copy this, and if I look at my cookies, we can see, yeah, that's indeed my cookie. I'm just using a, a Firefox add-in. I think it's called like cookie editor. Um, so yeah, that cookie matches what we saw here. But what that also means is any other user who browses to this address, loads this post, and happens to look at the comment section, they're going to try to call out to this remote image, and they're going to post a Git request to this remote web server with their browser's cookie, with their session cookie, being sent off to this remote web server. So I could wait until an admin user browses or another user browses, and all I got to do is copy the cookie that gets sent to me, throw it here, you know, just edit my session cookie to be equal to theirs, hit save, refresh the page, and now I have a session that's theirs, and I took over their account. So that's it. That's that's kind of the, the attack here and the demonstration. So how do we protect against this? What do we do to mitigate this? So as with any other vulnerability type, there's lots of ways you can try to mitigate against this attack, and there's no, like, one clear-cut answer because it really just depends on your web application. But for cross-site scripting, as I mentioned earlier in the video, using encoding on special characters that are needed in order to break out of HTML tags or create your own script tags, that would be a really good first step in trying to mitigate against this. And so this is an OWASP cheat sheet document that kind of has tons and tons of details about the different things you can do. But this is what I was talking about with the whole encoding thing, right? So these characters would get encoded to this value before being reflected back on the page. So HTML still knows how to render this and display the special character, but it can't be used for cross-site scripting because JavaScript's not going to understand that. So Encoding your special characters is going to be a really good mitigation strategy, but that's not the only thing you need to do, because what if maybe your input that that or the users that provided input is already inserted between two script tags? 
like an open and a close, right? Then they don't have to use special characters necessarily to execute a payload. They just have to insert JavaScript code. So this isn't foolproof. This is just one thing that you should do as part of your strategy. But another thing specifically for mitigating the attack that I just showed where you're stealing a session cookie is you can actually set this HTTP only flag. And so what this does is it basically enforces or it tells your browser not to send session cookies over anything that's not HTTP, right? So if JavaScript is requesting a session cookie, this flag being enabled on the web server and then enforced in the browser is going to tell the browser, hey, don't trust that, don't send it over. And it's gonna prevent this type of attack from working. So if this flag is set, even if you have a cross-site scripting flaw in your application, this flag can protect, at least for current modern browsers that support it, um, it, it can protect an end user from having their session stolen in the way I just showed you. All right, guys, that's it for this one. So I appreciate you checking this one out. And if you haven't already, please do consider hitting the like button. It's the easiest thing that'll just help me out a lot. Um, and I've made a lot of awesome, cool content that's kind of similar to this. So if you like this type of stuff, check out some of the other things I've had going on. I'm actually starting this new thing where I'm looking to bring content creators or other people in the industry on to do like live stream interviews. And I'm gonna try to start streaming more. So if that's something you wanna see, let me know. Give me your feedback in the comment section. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next video.